So anyway, uh, you came down uh, pretty hot and everything, and uh, you made it. That's a great thing to do. Yep. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Richard, and tell us who you are and sure. how you got to here. Sure, sure. Do you want the long version or yeah. the short version? No, no, long okay. version. Give okay. me the long version. Yeah. yeah, so my name is Richard Mentoyan. Mm -hmm. I'm the president of American Pistachio Growers. We're based in Fresno, uh, but we represent growers in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. And those are the three currently uh, commercial producing states of pistachios. Um, my history is that I grew up in Fowler mm -hmm. um, on a 40-acre vineyard that we grew grapes that we made into raisins. Uh, so involved in agriculture from a very young age. Yeah. I was involved in Future Farmers of America in high school, went on to Fresno State, uh, yeah. majored in ag business yeah. uh, with a specialization in finance. And my entire career has really been spent working for either ag trade associations or for uh, California commodity groups. Um, so I've worked work in that capacity my entire career. Um, and, and have enjoyed it. Uh, so I, I'm an ag guy inside oh, yeah. and out and through and through. Yeah. A lot of ag jobs go to pistachios, of course. Well, what I found interesting, I was doing some reading on pistachios, you know, and boning up for you. And yeah. uh, it, it's interesting where pistachios came from. They came from the Middle East. Yeah. And Persia yes. and Iran and how they made it to – California, which is like the perfect environment for pistachios. Now, how long ago did it start catching on? Well, the story of pistachios in California is a really interesting one. Yeah. Um, in 1929, the United States Department of Agriculture sent a researcher to Persia and other parts of the Middle East to gather seeds from pistachio trees right. with the intent of bringing them back to the United States and they actually brought him to a research facility in Chico, California. And over the course of any number of years, planted these pistachio trees, uh, reared them into production to try to find the best pistachio tree that would be suited for the California climate. Right. So that's in the 30s. Yeah. But the first pistachios were not planted in California until 1968. Wow. So there was this huge gap of time from when the seeds were brought in, trees were planted and produced, till they actually got into commercial planting. Right. Uh, and some of the first plantings were really in Northern California. Um, mm. and they really weren't down here. The first large acreage was in Kern County in 1968. But it wasn't until 1976 that the first commercial crop came off of pistachios yeah. uh, in California. So. You know, long, long history of when they were brought in to when they finally produced. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting thing. Now, when did they start getting really popular? So you and I can uh, think back to a yeah. time in the late 70s and, and 80s when the pistachios that we ate were dyed red in color. Right. And that's all that you really saw in the stores. Yeah. Was that... that uh, dyed red pistachio and you had to break open that yeah yeah you got to crack them <laughs> yeah. open you yeah. got your hands uh, yeah. with that with that color <laughs> your yeah. your lips and your your tongue yeah and those were pistachios that were coming into the united states from iran mm -hmm. um, and the reason why they were dyed red was the fact that they had imperfections on the shells they had like little dark dots on the shells and American consumers didn't take to that. So by coloring them red, they covered up that imperfection on the shell. Yeah. There was nev never anything wrong with the, the nut inside the shell. It was just that imperfection on the outside right. that consumers didn't like. So for years and years and years, um, all you saw was these red-colored dyed sure. pistachios. Yeah. And for the first few years that American pistachios were produced, they had to dye them that same color. Yeah. Because they didn't know them as that that opaque white color that, that we see today yeah. in pistachios. It's a healthy look now, as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Yeah, it's a yeah. healthy and, look. And what we learned um, producing them here in California 
is on the outside of that pistachio, there's a fleshy hull. And as soon as you harvest it, it starts to dry and adhere to the shell. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the reason why the Iranians had the problem with the pistachios, is that they were harvesting them and letting them, letting that outer hull sit too long in the sun. Right. So what we do here in California is within 24 hours of harvest, we remove that fleshy hull, usually a lot sooner than 24 hours. And by doing so, you don't have any of that staining yeah. or spotting on the shell. Yeah. So we're able to sell that natural white color. And you do that in, in process. In, in a process, right. yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've seen. I did a, um, a deal with the uh, automation too. That's a big deal. Yes, in, in your business. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. About? Well, I'll go through the the whole process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pistachios are harvested mechanically. Mm -hmm. There's two machines that go on either side of the tree. Mm -hmm. um, one's a shaker, one's a receiver, but both of them receive the nuts on it. Uh, a large arm comes out uh, underneath. Um, the, the machine grabs the trunk, shakes it for anywhere from two seconds, maybe up to five seconds to release the ripened nuts. They fall onto the shaker. They never fall onto the ground. That's right. one thing that's very unique about pistachios, yeah, yeah. Uh, that they never fall onto the ground. Anyway, they're received. Uh, and depending on the type of device, they may be put into bins and then transferred into a truck, or they may be... Um, into this um, a large receiver that then is then dumped into the truck. Right. Uh, regardless of the way uh, that they're um, harvested in the field, they're ultimately brought into the processor. And within that 24 hour period, they're washed and they're run through a huller to remove that outer fleshy hole. Yeah, skin, yeah. Yeah, yes. And then they're immediately put into a dryer. Uh, so Field moisture could be somewhere around 13, 14%, and they're generally dried down to about 6 to 7% moisture. And by drying them down to that level, it keeps them in a very stable form. Right. They're then put into these very large silos. Um, some of the largest silos today are probably a million to a million and a half pounds Jeez. of product. And it's interesting to see they're, they're dropped from the top, but they go down this like, it looks like a corkscrew. Mm -hmm. And then, so they're gently rolled down and then fill up this silo eventually. And uh, they're able to be kept into the silo, it kept in the silos for a long period of time. Uh, in some cases, year and a half, two years, because they're in, in optimal humidity type low humidity conditions and then they're brought out of those silos and then sorted electronically uh, and then um, sorted for color sorted for size sorted for open shell sorted for closed shell and then ultimately uh, will then go to a buyer or then they could be roasted there in the plant and then bagged up yeah yeah I, I was doing some research like we've got like a 2.1 billion dollar market here I, I don't. That was like maybe recent. It may have gone up. I, I don't know. It. I know it fluctuates. Yes. Right. Yes. Now there's an issue with good years and not so good years. Yes. We, Why don't we, you explain that? Yeah, we call them on and off years. Right. So an on year would be the tree tree produces heavy, and an off year would be that they produce light. There's very few commodities that are out there that have this, what's called alternate bearing. Uh -huh. uh, pistachios are one of them. Olives are one of them. Pecans are another one. Yeah. Um, and so we generally have these on and off years, large crops, small crops, and they tend to go back and forth uh, every other year. However, when you look at our history, we've had sometimes multiple years where we've had multiple on years and then other years where we've had multiple off years. Oh, really? And in fact, 2020, we had our largest crop in history. Right. 2021, we were expecting an off year. Mm -hmm. But in 2021, by golly, we ended up producing more than yeah. we did the year before. Yeah. So now here we are heading into 2022 harvest, and we're, we don't know, were we going to have an on year that it was supposed to be? Really? Or, so, or an off year. So you're not sure yet what, what's going on? 
Well, at the beginning of the year, we weren't sure. Now, as we get closer and You're closer right. to harvest, we're, we're able to kind of pinpoint that number a little bit more. And it looks like we're going to have a lesser crop than last year, which would technically mean that it, it's going to be an off year. Right. And last year, we had our largest crop in history, which was 1.16 billion pounds. Jeez. And that was Cal- California alone. Yeah. It- it's a smart business move, too, to go to pistachios because they have a lot longer shelf life, you know. And everybody was doing stone fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, at one time when we were young, you remember, you know, yeah. there was, everybody was doing peaches and stuff. And it's like they, they don't hold up that long, you know, yes. in, in the store. So, it, you know, it, it's an iffy thing. So, um, you know, the farmers. Well, think about it. You know, tree nuts, uh, and I'm talking about pistachios, almonds, walnuts, pecan. You know, they're they're more shelf stable. Right. But even within the tree nut family, we can have varying lengths uh, of of how long they can last. Walnuts, if they're not stored properly, can go rancid. Yeah. It's because of the high oil levels that are within them. But pistachios, almonds can be stored for a long time and, and do, do pretty well. Yeah. I got a story about walnuts. So I had... My grandfather showed me he put two in his hand, yep. and, and he crushed them, right? That's how he crushed walnuts. That's two. a strong hand. Yeah, so he says, when you're strong enough to do this, you know, so I did it. So I, had, yeah. I the kids, uh, my kid and my nephew, they are about the same age. They were in their 30s, and they were over at uh, Thanksgiving, and I grabbed a couple. Yeah. Well, and, and I said, look, and I went, crack. And I, and I gave them a, can you do that? And they were like, right. <laughs> Yeah, Yeah. it was just one of the things that we did, you know. Those are the tricks of a farm boy, you know, learning uh, how to grow or how to eat certain things that that you produce. Well, yeah, Yeah, I mean, you you were in the fig market, too. Yes, yeah, yeah. I worked for the California Fig Advisory Board for five years. Yeah, you're in specialty stuff because figs are, that's another specialty. Yes, and and I know the uh, Simone family goes a long ways in in the fig industry for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I worked for them, we also represented the fresh industry. Mm-hmm. And while the dried f- fig industry was going down, that, that interest uh, from consumers about fresh figs just continued to grow each and every year. And uh, it's amazing uh, how many people love fresh figs ar- around the U.S., of course, around the world. They're great when you can get them. Yes. You know, they, again, they, they spoil very quickly. Very you know, short shelf life. Yeah. Again, you know, that's what's good about the, the nut industry. And, yes. And it's real prolific. I mean, now, do your people, do they export a lot? Yes. Yeah. Typically, uh, our industry exports between 65 to 70 percent of what it produces right. in a given year. Um the countries of the European Union, the 27 uh, nations that represent the European Union, and China have gone back and forth as the number one export destination. The last couple of years, uh, probably due to the China tariffs, sure. we've seen more product go into the Europe into European Union. But, Is that right? Yeah. But, but both good. of those areas of the world are, are very, very good. Oh, yeah. Prolific. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, yeah, I was looking. I was really interested in that, too. So how did... And it affected a lot of people, the supply chain. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because people are really interested in that. Yeah. So the, you know, with having 65 to 70% of your product exported, um, you know, requires us to have to deal with the ports. Right. Um, most of our product does go out of Oakland. Sure. Uh, but uh, some do go out of Long Beach and, and LA yeah. as well. Um, so, yeah, it's... The availability of containers and the price of containers in the last year, as I've talked with people who market, have gone from about $2,500 upwards of about $20,000 to obtain a container. Whoa. And this is a container that, um, you know, a 20 foot container yeah. to hold your product. Trucking, uh, finding trucks available to transport your product. Um, and um, all the logistics that go with that. So you need a special trailer to carry those uh, containers. Yeah. And um, those are also in short supply because 
many empty containers are sitting on those chassis in some yard somewhere. Yeah. So that has gone up. Um, all the rules and regulations with how a truck moves through a port facility mm -hmm. and the type of truck that can be used. The right size. You know. Yeah, the right size. Yeah. They have to be clean, burn diesel. Uh, so that limits the number of entities that can do that type of transportation. Right. Um, so it, it definitely has had an effect. Um, the fact that container ships want to come and offload their product, generally from uh, China, uh, from other parts of Asia, and quickly go back um, because they could, it's more profitable for them to go back empty than it is for them to reload with product um, that are loaded, you know, containers that are loaded with product. Yeah. So it is a big challenge. Yeah. It, it has been. It's eased up ever so slightly, but continues to be a challenge. Yeah, I, I figured it would take a long time. You know, they, you know, somebody saying, "Oh, it's it's not going to be a short thing." It's like once you put a like a rock in that car. <laughs> yes, it, it it doesn't do that. It and takes, it, it and it's not just one pinch point. There's multiple pinch points. Yeah. as as I just discussed, and there's many, many other issues. And I know that uh, people have looked at uh, trucking stuff into Houston to have it shipped. Yeah, a there. lot of people are trying to do that. But hey, that wherever you go, there you are. You know, th there's yeah. going to be a backup. So yeah, there's different things. And they're trying to go to Florida with, with both. It's the size of the ship too, and, you know, and, yep. and, and it really gets, it gets technical and people don't understand. And then there's the distribution warehouse and they only have so many docks and so many people and so much racking, so right. much storage. And, and it, it's very fine and it has to be because you're yep. paying per pound for everything. Right? Yes, yeah. and we're on a per pound basis, a high priced commodity. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of demand worldwide, and so what we've seen is, despite some of the challenges that we have in shipping, that product is getting through. It's getting through kind of forcibly, and in other cases, there's product being shipped to destination without it being sold, and the purpose of that is to get it somewhere in a timely manner yeah. so that the buyers have uh, quick access to it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is, but it, it's grown a lot. Pistachios have grown a lot. Yeah. I mean, the percentages are staggering. Yeah when, you, yeah, when you look, we've tripled the amount of acreage in the last 15 years. Yeah. It really is tripled the amount of acreage. And um, we've seen a lot of row crop growers. Um, so that could be garlic, it could be tomatoes, and it could be cotton. Yeah. And we've seen other permanent plantings. So we've seen people who have had almonds, people who have had grapes, people who have had stone fruit right. uh, switch over to pistachios. Oh, and yeah. Why pistachios? Yeah. <laughs> uh, pistachios because uh, they do better uh, or they do as well in less quality soil. Yeah. With less quality water, yep. which we have a lot of that on the, the yep. west side of California. They do less. They do well with less water right so when you compare it to almonds or other things that take a, a lot of acre feet per uh year to grow yeah um pistachios do well now we still require water don't sure. get me wrong oh no no yeah, yeah yeah but one of the great things about pistachios is unlike um, other commodities if you give it less water it's still going to produce right other commodities you don't give it uh the sufficient amount of water that tree could die yeah. or just not produce. Yeah, almonds are very tricky. It, 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 it's a very tricky thing. And I see pistachios just growing, and that's why I got so interested in pistachios. Was it, The market's just – there's, there's got to be a lot of marketing, too, on your end. Yeah, right? yeah, there definitely that's is. That's what you do a lot of. Let, let me talk a, a yeah. little bit about uh, – California grows 99% of the nation's pistachio. So right. even though we have growers in Arizona and New Mexico, the majority of it is in California. Of that 99% that's grown in California, 97% today is from Merced County to the north to the base of the grapevine. 
So it's really the San Joaquin it's Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's more plantings going on uh, in Northern California, more availability of water, changeover of commodities, particularly some of the almonds and walnuts that's been up north. They've transferred or they're now growing pistachios. Um, so, yeah, we're really highly concentrated here. So talking about marketing yeah. uh, and the, the need to continue to market, pistachios have been viewed by consumers as the number one favorite nut that they like to eat. Oh, yeah, they're great. Who, who doesn't like pistachios, no, right? Yeah. Pistachio <laughs> ice cream. It's, I could eat pistachio anything. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. But consumers haven't always ranked us as high in terms of health. They think of walnuts and they think of almonds. Really? Almonds tend to be viewed as heart healthy. Uh, Walnuts have omega-3 fatty acids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But pistachios have a lot of good properties. Yeah. We're a complete protein. So we are the only source of of protein that you don't have to, to cook that's a complete protein. Another complete protein would be things like soy protein Mm -hmm. or uh, quinoa or things like that. So we're a complete protein. We contain the nine essential building blocks. um, The amino acids. The amino acids to to life. We're also high in fiber. Yeah. Uh, We're a good source of protein. Um, And we have potassium. And a lot of people don't know about potassium. People think potassium like in bananas. Uh-huh. And people would eat bananas after a workout. Pistachios are just as good for you after a workout for muscle recovery. Oh, yeah. So there's um, there's all these great nutritional uh, profile of pistachios that we have an opportunity to market on and to get even more consumers focused on our Absolutely. Crop. Yeah, yeah, the bodybuilding thing, that, that's a big deal because protein powder and um, I, I would imagine now they're going to do pistachio powder <laughs> and fillers and stuff, you know. And, and you guys had uh, a lot of great re- – you, you put a lot of great recipes, and I'll list your website. But, I mean, you, you guys do that too. I mean, you even get into – yeah, we do nutritional research because we want to find out the what are the good, healthy, nutritious properties about pistachios yeah. uh, for your body, for your health, um, and be able to let consumers know about it. Because let's face it, we we may like a particular product, but when we find out that it's good for you as well yeah. and tastes good, then we will eat it even more. And yeah. that's certainly what we want to do with pistachios. Yeah, high shelf life. I mean, I mean that whole thing, you know, they, you can't beat that in the stores. You know, you, you go in the stores and, and they're expensive, but hey, you know, you, you get what you pay for too. So. Yeah, you're getting a, a high dense uh, nutritional product uh, when you buy pistachios. They're, they're easy to eat. Well, you just got to crack them open. Uh, There was actually a lot of them. There was actually a study done called the Pistachio Principle, and it it, uh, measured uh, people cracking pistachios and how many they would eat. And just the the time that it takes to crack them and to eat them slowed down your caloric intake. So there is something good. It it feels good to crack them open, but you also reduce the amount of calories that you might consume. The other great thing about pistachios compared to the other nuts, a serving size of walnuts is about 12 halves. Okay. It's about 23 almonds. But for pistachios, a serving size of one ounce is 49 nuts. So 49 nuts is only 160 calories. You get three grams of fiber, two grams of protein, um, and a tremendous amount of other nutritional benefits it's that are good handful. for you. Yeah, it's definitely a handful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's really good. You know, people don't understand. It's like, so take a, like a handful to the gym with you and just eat them and drink some water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there you go. There's your pro, your $5 protein. Drink, and you have that potassium you know. for, the, uh, yeah. for the muscle recovery at the end. Yeah, yeah. There, you, you know, those things are expensive. You know, they, and young people go for that. Don't you? They, you know, they they do a lot of studying. 
when it comes to now they do you know um, muscle development mm -hmm. and everything you know after workout and recovery and everything and you know i've heard of coconut water and all this stuff sure but yeah the, the pistachio protein it, it's it's something. Well, and one of the things that we do is we have a number of ambassadors in various countries, both here in the U.S. and, and overseas, to help talk the message, speak the message about pistachios. Yeah. So uh, whether it be someone in soccer or, or football, as it's known yeah. elsewhere, yeah, sports. Uh, or outdoor sports, we want to make sure that we connect with people that that are a good representation of health and fitness and active lifestyle. Right. Soccer is like the biggest sport there is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In Europe, and, you know, and you're you know, exporting to Europe, which there you go right there. And for people who are familiar with uh, European football, we had Jesse Lingard as one of our ambassadors. Yeah. And he has a lot of followers. And, you know, he did a number of promotions with us, with us regarding pistachios. Right. So how did you get into pistachios? I mean, did you just get one of these calling things, you know, or, or how that how that work out for you? Well, as I mentioned, you know, just working in agriculture my entire career, yeah. um, this opportunity came up in 2008. And I looked at it and I said, you know, pistachios look to me to be a really growing commodity. Yeah behind almonds and walnuts at that time. Yeah, they were real popular. Almonds have always been really popular. Yeah. And pistachios, that's why I'm interested. Pistachios have really grown in interest. Yeah. Yeah. And so because of the growth that I saw that was occurring and just talking with people in the industry and knowing that th there was a great opportunity uh, to, to help promote a really good commodity, uh, I, you know, uh, applied for the position and, yeah. and was selected for it. And, you know, I, I say when we started out, um, we had two of us on staff. Right. Um, and our budget was about $1.2 million. And here we are 15 years later. Yeah. We're now 14 staff and our budget is about $18 million. Jeez. So we've grown that much. Um, you you and, grew – proportionally with the industry yes That's, yeah. That, yeah 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 you, 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 and and growers um you know you you growing up at a farm have oh yeah. you know that you have to show to the grower that you're able to promote your product right. and make a difference for the assessments that they pay into the organization right and we've been able to show that uh that with our promotion with our government relations that we that we have and I haven't mentioned that yet but with that with um, nutrition research we're providing consumers with more and more of a reason to want to eat pistachios and right. make it make it the tree nut that they want to purchase oh yeah it's definitely a great great item to eat but yeah you know you're saying we grew up we there's so many jobs too associated with the pistachio market and the growth that that occurred it's unbelievable yes i mean i was looking at that too you, you, you a huge growth yeah we did an economic de uh development study just to show the uh the width the breadth and the width of our industry right. we have about um, sixty thousand jobs that are related uh, to pistachio uh, both growing and processing here in california uh, our farm gate value, which is just what is paid to the growers, right. is about two point eight billion. Jeez. We're we're now the fourth largest commodity in the state of California. Unbelievable! All you have to do is go 10, 12 years ago. We weren't even in the top no. ten. No, yeah, people would yeah, you'd starve for those things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You go, you got pistachios. Yeah, okay, you know, get yeah, a, you know, you'd get a, a gunny sack. You know, right? You know, the, yeah, the gunny sacks and stuff, walnuts and pistachios. You know, that, yeah. that was a fun deal. But yeah, we grew up in farming, and you know, I um, when I was a kid, my dad made me pick figs. Yeah, you know, it, it was. You know, I grew up, you know, pretty pretty good and everything on the right side of town and good schools and everything. And I don't know, I was giving my mom a bunch of guff one day, and he comes home and he says, "Yeah, you need a job." And I was like, "Oh, okay." 
you know <laughs> what am i gonna do you know he says we're gonna pick figs and i went yeah uh -oh. and you know yeah i did uh, dry figs you know i yep. picked them off the ground and i swear to god a box was an unbelievable amount <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it took you a long, yeah, a long time, time to, get to fill that. a box, yes. and I'm on my knees, you know, and and he came, he let me on. He, he says, "You got water?" No. He goes, "Here's your water. Here's some food. <laughs> I'll come back at noon." And I'm like, "Noon?" You know, and I got these five gallon buckets, you know, and and I don't know how many I did. It was, I, I think I made it three days. Oh my, yeah, three days, and and I was like, yeah, I was like thirteen or something. And he goes, so do you know what it is to be a farmer and to work now? And I was yeah. like, yeah. And we used to blow a horn. He had a horn on the truck and to scare the birds, you know. Oh. There was all kind of weird stuff going on back right. then. You right. know, water and everything, you know, the way we did things. But, yeah, I, I, I really learned. Growing up on the farm, too, uh, that we uh, mentioned we grew grapes to make into raisins. Yeah. So I, my brother and I would pick a couple of short rows by the house um, that was uh, easy for us to do. There yeah. was about 10 vines. But we did a lot of, um, not turning, but the rolling of the trays. Oh, yeah. That's a and, big deal. Yeah. That's hard. Yeah. yeah hard work. Yeah. And I couldn't wait for school to start. Oh, yeah. So that I, <laughs> so that's I didn't yeah. need to do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mom, Dad, I'm back at school. Well, the rain, too. Yes. And that was a that's a big and a bad thing, you know. You roll those things and the rain comes along yep. and you know, the the insurance, the dehydration. It, it's, I, I can remember some of the bad rain years, seventy eight. There was another your dad one. standing out there just <laughs> Yeah, eighty two was another one. The rain just pretty much wiped out uh, the raisins because they were lying on the ground exposed yeah. Um, oh, yeah. to the elements. That, I oh that would People don't understand, and I. This is why I, I got into this and everything. I wanted to explain to the people: these farmers are the unsung heroes, and people don't. They have no understanding. Right. Uh, farming <clears throat> built cities. Okay, it, cities didn't build farms. Okay, yep. so you look at New York, L.A., San Francisco. We'll talk about the big cities. Uh, they grew because. Of farming communities that surrounded them and brought their goods right. to these cities to allow them to grow. You can't grow without food. An aggregate uh, uh, cycle is where, where everyone started right. in, in ag, and then they kind of built up from there. There's right. no doubt about it. Yeah, my, my big deal is food isn't growing in Costco and Walmart parking lots, man. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it, it's grown by hardworking people. Yes. And, and you've seen that, you know, you've seen what your parents went through and everything. It was all hands on deck. Yeah, yeah. You know. We were a small family farm, and that's the way it was. My brother and my two sisters. Yeah. Yeah, we were involved. We boxed raisins. So, yeah, yeah I, I, I get it. Um, yeah. But, you know, the availability of labor is another reason yeah. why people are turning to these commodities, particularly tree nut commodities, yeah. that can be mechanized. Absolutely. Um, so two people can run 500 acres of pistachios, right. li literally. It doesn't yeah. take a lot. And then you have the mechanical harvesting crew that comes in. That's a big deal. Yeah. And that requires a lot of pieces of machinery, but it's, <clears throat> it's a whole lot less people, uh, than let's say the equivalent of trying to uh, cut grapes or do gondola wine, or, right. you know, something like that. Well, the good thing about pistachios, too, in, in the farming deal is you don't make all that dust that almonds do. Well, See, that's, that's a problem. And, it, and I was talking to an innovator um, of a machinery, you know, and, and they do, you know, pistachios, and you're probably saying them. And um, I was telling him, I said, you got to do something about the sweepers, man, because they're going to pull the switch. It's coming. Not to speak bad about no, my brethren no. in the other tree nut commodities, yeah, but no. because pistachios don't fall to the ground, right, uh, and they're they're caught on these catch frames from the machines, there's very little dust, yeah. dust I know. At, at all. I know people you, don't understand that they see they they, and that's what I wanted to you know get it through and talk to you about too. It's it's very important that it doesn't get mixed into the almond industry because not to say anything bad about almonds. But it, it, 
they don't have the sweepers involved. Right. So, I mean, all that dirt and stuff. And I was telling them, I said, look, you know, you, you got to innovate something and because it's coming. And I could see it. And I, I've seen I seen the trucks coming and stuff, and that wasn't good at all either. Sure. And they just pull switches. You don't – they don't know how to fix the problem. Mm-hmm. They just throw the switch. <laughs> yeah. You fix the problem. <laughs> As you, as you know, you know, being, being in the industry so long. Well, one of the questions that get asked me a lot is, um, what do you do with pistachios that fall on the ground? Right. We leave them. And yeah. the reason for that is that pistachio, the shell, more than likely 85% of the pistachios that come off the tree already have an open shell. Right. And if that falls into the, the ground, uh, there's a potential contamination, certainly. But it's also, if you get sand inside of that shell, the, even the washing process, even the sorting process, you can have sand or dirt inside that pistachio. Yeah. And we don't want that. No. We, don't, we don't want a bad consumer experience. No. So if it falls to the ground, it remains on the ground. It gets dissed up and for sanitation purposes at the end of the year. Yeah, I, I've eaten a lot of pistachios in my life, and I've never had a problem with it. Yeah, <laughs> right? Oh, no. Yeah, why? never, never. Yeah, no, yeah. that's a smart thing. You know, it, it, another interesting fact was I was reading about the um, – they, they have coyote problems, and they put owls. You know, it's really interesting to, to scare off the coyotes because they eat the plastic and on the um, on the drip lines. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And cause a big problem. Yes. Yeah. That appears to be a growing problem. Yeah. Uh, with coyotes, pups chewing on on the line uh, because of teething, but also the mature uh, coyotes chewing on the line to try to get a source of water. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's it's it definitely is a problem. Some people have been innovative and they put like little buckets of water so the coyotes will uh, drink the water. D- d- develop a learned practice to go to that pail of water instead of chewing on the line. Interesting. So there's there's methods that are being looked at uh, to try to you know resolve issues that we have out there right the owl boxes are used for gopher control and right. other rodents yeah gophers too yeah yeah yeah, it, yeah that's uh, you've, you've been around that it can oh, be a problem <laughs> oh that was a bad one yeah, yeah yeah and and we got we got rid of them in some very bad ways back then you know it, things were different but uh yeah, the gophers were real bad. They'd load those roots. Yeah, you know, yep. So. The, the Food Safety Modernization Act that was passed here in the U.S. in 2011 mm-hmm. really kind of changed the way people are required to grow food for consumers. And there's a lot more attention to making sure that practices are implemented so that we don't have contamination. That's not going to stop all contamination of food, and we see and hear about it all the time. But at the very least, if we can say, we're not going to have roaming animals in orchards. We're going to make sure that the water that's used on those trees are tested. Make sure that the, the processing plant has procedures in place to minimize any kind of contamination. That's what the industries had to do and, mm-hmm. and innovate in that way uh, to comply with the law, but more importantly, to make sure we don't have any issues with consumers out, out there. Yeah. Now, you said you um, you work with the government? We do. We Go have yeah. yeah, we have lobbyists at both the state and the federal capitals, so in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., most of our work has tended to be on the federal side, um, dealing with things like pesticide residue levels right. that are established in countries, opening up trade with various countries. So anytime there's a new trade deal being considered, we want to make sure that pistachios are a part of that. Yeah. Uh, we want to be able to have free access to, to various countries. Um So working on really anything and everything that can affect our growers' ability to grow, to harvest, and to market their product. It's one of the very few items that we export, which is a neat thing, you know. Well, almonds. um, Yeah, we export a lot of almonds. A lot of almonds, and the same thing with with walnuts as well. Yeah, Um, yeah. 
When we look at more of the specialty perishable commodities, yeah. less of that is exported just because the fact that it's reefers. Perish, yeah, 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 it requires a, yeah. a reefer unit, and it's just that shorter of a shelf life. Um, well, yeah, it, it's, people don't understand that either. They, that reefer can go and say you're, se- you're, you're selling melons to Japan. All that reefer could sit there for days and just everything die yeah. inside. You know, no, no, and oh, we just forgot about it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. You know, I just lost a hundred thousand dollars worth of melons. You yep. know? Think about some of these large container ships. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the largest are fifteen thousand containers. Yeah, it's immense. So there's there's obviously a good a computerized system in place. But once it's offloaded uh, and and moved, it you know finding that product and making sure that it gets to where it needs to go in a timely manner yeah. is pretty pretty difficult. Oh, it's unbelievable the the, the amount of, of work that's involved at the docks and, and the boats and, and offloading and separations and to get from you know people don't understand how many hands yeah touch something. Yes. You know, before it gets to your hands and home. Yes. <laughs> you know, you just see the finished product. Yeah. You don't realize all those oh. steps that you were talking about to get it there. You know, the growing and the harvesting is just a part of that. Yeah. Then there's the processing and the sorting and then the roasting and then the bagging and then the transportation to the store. Oh, yeah. And, and then there's brokers and guys selling stuff in between and picking up. There, there's... It's an unbelievable amount of business that's created through, you know, through the valley and everything. Yeah. I just hope it keeps getting bigger. Our problem is water, you know. Yes. And, you know, and you're into that and everything. So I read a, it was, it's pretty ridiculous. I read a, a DNA, in fact, it was today. And before I came down here, I was reading this article about, and they said it was a, the 200, you probably heard about it, the 200, year storm oh. and they're talking about in the 1800s you know and i guess you know when they when they started looking at um measuring you know water and everything it, what was it the late 1800s or something like that so it, it, they're talking about you know it raining a lot and all this destruction that it did and it's like do you know we have dams now <laughs> right you know, and that's our problem. You know, our our reservoirs. We need bigger reservoirs and more reservoirs, and to yeah. collect more water. And you know, I, I talk to um, <clears throat> ten professionals, and every one of them gave me a different answer. Mm. Uh, it, but it was all good solutions. It was they were, but everybody had a different answer on how to control the water issues. Sure. So there's that many holes. One of our members characterized it this way, and and uh, I'd, I'd like to repeat what they said. Absolutely. They said, um, think about our freeway system here in California, and think about if we didn't update and expand our freeway system from the 1960s. Absolutely. What kind of mess this state would be in. That's exactly the state that we're in state of affairs that we're in with water. Right. There hasn't been any major water project done in California since the late 1960s. Yeah. And yet we've doubled our population from Triple. We, okay. I, no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I went in, I dug <laughs> into this stuff and it's like, you know, it's like, how do you say, you know, they're, they're like, well, <clears throat> they're going to do this tunnel thing now. Yeah. Well, so that, that's revised again. That, that, yeah, yeah. Okay, yep. that started out as a two, you know, the Brainiacs got involved and they did it right. And they went, okay, look, we need two tunnels. We need to do this. And it, you've seen when that started. That was a long time ago. That mm-hmm. was like Jerry Brown days. And then it went to now and now it's like one tunnel. Mm-hmm. Well, wait a minute. Where did that $20 billion go? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how much interest did that twenty billion dollars make? And where's that? <laughs> it's disappeared. <laughs> there, there has been talk that just overcoming the environmental hurdles, yeah, um, to even put a tunnel in place could yeah. be decades. Yeah, there's lawsuits. There, there yeah, yeah, there's there's no short term solution uh, to this all, and unfortunately, there's going to be suffering 
that, that occurs. And it's not just going to be within the ag community. Think about all these rural communities. Yeah. Um, and they're relying on the same source of water. Uh, so fallowing land is is not going to be the solution. No. We did need to develop more storage facilities. Uh, we need to make sure that um, you know we capture this runoff right, and, and not let it go out to the sea. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of it is in, is rooted within the Endangered Species Act. Mm-hmm. And changing that may be impossible. Uh, part of it, you know, certainly can be in better conservation, but we just need to build the infrastructure right. commensurate with the size of the state that we have. Yeah. Well, in the Valley, it was interesting because of the 80s, wood went away and lumber was huge. Mm. And people don't, you know, they, they don't realize that Salonkin Valley, they ate half of their industry. It just went away, you know, and everything can go away really easy. Right. And people like yourself, you know, we've got to have people like you out there, you know, fighting the good fight out there and telling people, hey, wait a minute, you know, we got to. You know, we, there's a lot of business out here because yeah. we don't have the votes. Right. You know, that's what it comes down to is we don't have six million, you know, or 10 million, 20 million votes that we can say this is the way we want things. So we have to fight for everything. But like I said, all cities are built on farming. Yeah. You know, San Francisco Gold Rush and everything. Well, every, then the uh, Los Angeles was really interesting. The um, Orange County, that was from a lot of people came from um, Oklahoma. And when, all you know, that went yeah. bad and they all walked here and everything, Grapes of Wrath and everything. But a lot of them ended up going and doing orange fields. What was it, in the 30s or 40s, L.A. County was the number one ag county yeah. in the, in the yeah. state of California? Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, and then— and It's now, amazing to— and, L.A.? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's, real that's estate. How... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people don't understand about um, Oxnard and uh, strawberries. Yes. You know, you know about all that and everything. And, you know, there's still, and that land's worth a lot of money, you know. Yeah. But, hey, you got to turn it into ag to yeah. housing, you know, you know that, all that. But, yeah, I, I, just ho- I just hope we keep going and uh, – you know, people, we get more people like you, you know, out there and because that's what you do, right? Yeah, that, that's uh, live and breathe agriculture and representing our membership of pistachio growers and making sure that their interests are, are heard yeah. um, in the state and federal capitals and then making sure that we educate consumers about this, this great product. Absolutely. In fact... I misquoted the amount of grams of protein, and per serving, which is forty nine nuts, we have six grams of protein. I, I think I had mentioned two. In how many? In forty nine nuts. Yeah. Which is one serving of pistachio. Yeah. So it's amazing the powerhouse of nutrition. What does that have on the back of it? Is so it, we have a nutritional say, label, yeah. and we yeah. actually compare um, pistachios to other commonly known foods. So two ounces. Of Protein-wise, two ounces of pistachio kernels, which is 12 grams, right. has the same amount of protein as two ounces of cooked halibut. Really? Yeah. Fiber, two ounces of pistachio kernels, has as much fiber as two ounces of cooked broccoli. And two ounces isn't a whole lot. No, 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 no. You know, yeah. weight-wise. And pota- pista- uh, excuse me, uh, potassium, two ounces of pistachio kernels is equivalent to one large banana. So that's just is that right? Yeah, that giant, that's so, enormous. So um, amazing amount of nutrition in in this nut. Yeah, and um, in many ways, you know, each one of the tree nuts have their own kind of special area where they stand out in in terms of <clears throat> what they have nutritionally, and you know, pistachios have fats, but they are the good fats like avocados right. and olive oil. Yeah, yeah. Try to get that message out to just a tremendous amount of aspects about our commodity that we're learning more and more about every day, yeah. and and why they're good for you. Yeah, at the I, I go to health foods, and, and you know, that's where I do all my shopping and 
how I eat, and I always shoot pistachios. <laughs> <So then, laughs> but again, it costs money to to get it. And if people don't understand that, the grocery store it, it's a store and it's like a warehouse, and you got to pay to get the good spots too. Yes, you know that's a whole nother. You know, we're talking yeah. about marketing. You know, you, the consumer has got to see that. Yes. Yeah. See it or they got to know about it through whatever means they get information and then go to the store and seek that product out. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what we try to create on the marketing side about about pistachios. Create consumer demand ahead of the production uh, that we currently have. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And by keeping demand up and getting people focused on it, that's going to keep – uh, the economic returns that, that growers have. It sounds like the European market are more educated. They are. That used to be a market that was dominated by Iran. Right. But Iran has a particular issue called aflatoxin. And it's highly regulated in the uh, EU, not as much regulated in the in the U.S., uh, but still, still regulated. For every one load that we may have rejected in the EU, which is very seldom, there's 15 loads from Iran that are rejected. Really? So it is a problem that, and it prevents them from really shipping the amount of product that they could ship uh, into that area of the world. So we've taken over a larger and larger market share from them uh, uh, in that area of the world. Now, what is that chemical that you said? What is so it? it's not really a chemical. Pistachios, um, we have a particular insect that's common also to almonds called navel orange worm. Right, right. Uh, and they were in figs as well. Yeah. When they feed on the inside kernel, it causes a, a wound or an exposure point. Yeah. And naturally occurring molds, and there's a whole variety of, of molds uh, called mycotoxins that are out there. Right. Um, Aflatoxin is the one that's specific to pistachios. So if you have a high degree of insect damage, right. there's the high pro higher probability that you could have aflatoxin. Right. So pistachios are sorted out to make sure that anything that has insect damage is pulled out of the line. Uh, and then it's tested uh, both here in the U.S. and tested abroad, uh, particularly th that product that's going into the European Union. And we make sure that we don't have product that, that goes there. Anything that's over tolerance cannot be shipped to the European Union. Right. Yeah, that's a big deal. See, that's what we do, though. The food, it's yeah. It's America. Yeah, yeah, and we everything. have the ability to look for it, sort for it, test for it, and make sure that we don't ship that, that kind of product. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we have a lot better better systems yes. of, of recovery and chemicals and everything and EPAs and all that. You deal with all that, too. Yeah, that. we do. Yeah, yeah, we absolutely do. Yeah, yeah. You, you wear a lot of hats. <laughs> no, you do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're kind of unique. Um, there are the typical trade associations, let's say like Farm Bureau or Western Growers yeah. Association. Then there are commodity boards, and local commodity boards might be like – the Fig Advisory Board right. or the Table Grape Commission, the Almond Board. Those are the ones that do uh, research and promotion. Yeah, We're unique in that we do both. Right. We straddle both. We do both government relations, like a typical trade association, and we do generic promotion and consumer education. Yeah, I noticed that. Like a commodity board. So yeah. that, that's what makes us a very unique organization amongst others yeah it, it, and that's an issue that that i saw and that's why i got into this is everybody's sp spread out there's so many different organizations doing the same thing almost well there's a lot of us that get together in sacramento and yeah. washington dc when there's like-minded issues we'll work together on the nutrition side, there's a group called the Nutrition Research Education Foundation. The name's not as important as what we do. It's pistachios, almonds, walnuts, uh, pecans, hazelnuts, um, and macadamia nuts. All put money in. The whole goal of the organization is to do like-minded tree nut research. Right. Because 
the the properties of one are the properties of many. Of all, that, yeah. yes, of all, and we can we can do that kind of health research uh, that's going to help promote promote our product. Now we still do our own specific pistachio related sure. research, but when there's something that that cuts across multiple commodities, that's good. It, we work together. Yeah, that, that's good. You're not spread out too thin, then, and, and everybody's working together and doing going the right direction. Yeah, and leveraging our dollars against their dollars yeah, to get time and money. Yeah, to get the job done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say? I'll just say that water is going to impact this valley. Yeah, uh, we haven't even talked about Sigma, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Yeah, um, and even though the goal is to become sustainable by 2040, the fact is that the various sustainable groundwater agencies are starting to l limit the amount of that growers can pump out of the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to have more of an impact next year and the year after and the year after. Yeah. And that impact is going to be seen as growers either fallowing acres because they're only going to be able to pump certain so amount, many, yeah. so many acre feet out of the ground. Yeah. Or it's going to cause other commodities to um, not be grown at all. Yeah, I can go into certain parts of Madera County and show you whole almond orchards that have not been irrigated. Yeah, um, and they're all brown right now, yeah. and they should still be green. Yeah, and there's not going to be any harvest going on. Uh, so Sigma is going to have a tremendous impact. Right. Um, so water in general. Um, and the availability of it, the cost of it, the reliability um, is all going to be issues that this, not only our industry, but oh, all so of ag yeah. is going to have to deal with in, yeah. the, in the very near future. And when I say near, it could be, it's already happening. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, there's water, water districts that, that yeah. are only getting some are, that are at zero, some that are at 5%, 10%. Yeah. Um, now the restrictions that are going to be implemented on groundwater pumping is just going to have a tremendous impact. And we can have a valley that goes back to what it was, which was a desert. Oh, yeah. Or we can find solutions to it. And I think there are solutions out there. Good, good. Glad you're on it. And I appreciate you coming in. And uh, I learned a lot from you. Pat, always good to be with you. Okay. Have a great day. <laughs>